Okay, so now we're going to start going over <clears throat> the June 2016 U.S. History Regents exam. And again, I'll be using the questions here as a kind of jumping off point to uh, review in general uh, U.S. history. Okay, so we start with the multiple choice. Okay, uh, U.S. history regents exams almost always begin with um, geography questions. So if we look at geography questions here, right, we start off with this. Which geographic features had the most significant positive influence on settlement patterns and economic development in the British North American colonies? Well, clear and easy answer here. Rivers and harbors. So the early colonists all settled around harbors. Why? Because that's where they were getting their supplies from. Um, traveling inland for the early colonists would have been extremely difficult. And so you wanted to settle somewhere it was convenient to get to. You come off the boat and that's where you settle. And someplace it would have been easy for you to get supplies as they came in from ships and where it would have been easy for you to um, uh, put whatever products you had on the ship to be brought back to England to sell. <clears throat> so in Virginia, that's tobacco. That was the cash crop. That was where all the money was, was in tobacco. So your first settlements are right along the shoreline and up the James River there in Virginia. You have your farm there. You can take it right down to the river, put it on a boat, and take it out through the harbor to England. In the New England colonies, um, you look at Boston, uh, Plymouth, Cape Cod, um, and then eventually Providence in, uh, in Rhode Island and places like New Haven in uh, Connecticut. They're all harbors, and they're mostly uh, harbors that are the mouths of rivers. Um, again, so if you have farmers who are a little bit up the river, there's good land by the, by the rivers and creeks, they can easily take it down to the harbor, put it on a ship, and take it out. One of the reasons New York has become the Empire State and has been such a powerful economic engine is because we have truly one of the world's great harbors here as New York Bay. And uh, the Dutch, as we know, originally settled here. It's the mouth of the Hudson River, and so they had uh, um, hunting and farming all along the Hudson Valley, could take it right down to New York and out. So rivers and harbors were key. The other choices there, prairies and lakes. We don't, you know, British colonies don't get anywhere near the prairies. The prairies are all out in what's now Louisiana Purchase Territory, North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, Nebraska, like that. It was nowhere near it. And the Great Lakes, out by Michigan, Ohio there, the British colonies don't go that far. That's French territory at the time of the British colonies. And even after the French Indian War, when England gets its hands on Canada and those territories of the Ohio River Valley, um, they don't really use the Great Lakes much because the lakes aren't really connected to anything. It's not until the Erie Canal comes along, which is in our next question, that the Great Lakes are connected to New York Harbor. And we'll get to that in a minute. So prairies and lakes are out. Forests and deserts. Well, deserts is the key there. Maybe you could say that in New England, the forests were helpful. New England, as we know, whereas uh, um, uh, Virginia, the crop was tobacco. New England, it was fishing and to some degree lumber. So you could say forests might be helpful there, but eh, that's kind of weak. And certainly, again, the British colonies were nowhere near deserts. Mountains and plateaus. Plateaus are kind of useless for us, and mountains limited settlement. The, there was only so far inland that the early colonists could go because the Appalachian Mountains made it difficult 
to have farms on the other side. You had to ship all your products over the mountain. You'd drag it, really, by horse wagon over the mountain to get it to any place you could sell it. So the only choice here that makes sense is rivers and harbors. The Erie Canal, number two here, played a large role in the settlement of the Midwest because it provided a link between the Atlantic Ocean and what? So let's take a look at this. Okay, so this is our Erie Canal here. Um, and as you can see, right, we have um, Lake Erie on one end of it. If I can get this up here to do what I want. Hang on, guys. Okay, so, whoop, pull it up again, that, okay, so we've got Lake Erie at one end of it over here, Buffalo to Troy, New York, and this is the Erie Canal in the middle here, Hudson River, Hudson River takes you down to New York City. And so the point of it is it connects Lake Erie to the Hudson River to get you to New York. So what is the point of the Erie Canal? You got what was called then the West, or the Midwest, we would call it now, Ohio over here, uh, Indiana, Illinois, that area, all the areas that are north of the Ohio River. If you were a farmer out here, to get your stuff from there to New York, where you could then ship it out to the rest of the world. That took about six weeks. You were passing over Pennsylvania, which is these, um, you know, pretty severe mountain ranges. It took about six weeks, and let's say, let's make up a number, it cost you 100 bucks to move a bushel of wheat from Ohio to New York. The Erie Canal, you could put your wheat onto a ship on Lake Erie, take it up to Buffalo, transfer it to a canal barge. Buffalo to New York City through the Erie Canal was not six weeks, it was six days. And the cost went from a hundred bucks a bushel to like five bucks a bushel. That meant that you could sell this uh, wheat at a much cheaper price, still make a profit, and charge much less overall. Consumers, therefore, saw their food prices drop by like 90%. It also meant that it was now worthwhile going out to that Ohio River Valley to um, start your farming, settle out there. You could make money at it. It made New York the premier port in all of America because hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of goods were now going to pass through it. And it really made upstate New York into something. All these little towns along the, uh, the canal were created primarily to serve the canal. So the goal there is... Um, to, you know, if you're going down the canal, if it's taking you six days, you've got to stop along the way. You've got to, you know, stay overnight. You want to sleep. You want to get something to eat. So you've got these little hotels, little restaurants, and um, the canal barges were moved by mule. So you had a towpath that went along the side of the canal, um, and the mules would... Um, walk down the towpath and drag the barge along. So, uh, you know, if a barge is in water, you don't need a lot of energy to get it moving because there's no friction. But you needed to change mules every once in a while. So these little towns grow up along the canal. Well, if you've got a town along the canal, that's a great place to have industry, a little factory, because it's cheap to get raw material to your factory, and then you make it into whatever you make, furniture or whatever, and easy to ship it back out because you're right there on the canal. So all those towns upstate, Lockport, Rochester, Syracuse, Utica, 
um, Rome, Schenectady, and then out to Albany and Troy really were made by the canal. They became these little industrial centers. So when you think of the Erie Canal, you have to think of the following. First, you have to think, uh, goes through upstate New York, connects the Great Lakes, and therefore the Midwest to the Hudson, and therefore um, the port of New York City. Second, therefore, it makes the Midwest very attractive for settlers and farmers, and it makes New York City um, the Empire City, as it's called. Third, because it drops, no kidding, by 90 or 95 percent the cost of moving those goods, it greatly cheapens um, the price of food and other goods for people all over the country, because once you get it to New York, you can take it up and down the East Coast to any other city you feel like. So that's what to think about when you see the Erie Canal. What's going to kill the Erie Canal? Erie Canal still exists in upstate New York, by the way. It's still there, but it's not really used for commercial transport much. Why? Because it was replaced first by the railroads, and then much later in the 1950s by roads. So the first great railroad in New York is called the New York Central. And where does it go? From New York City up the Hudson to Albany, makes a left-hand turn, and then across upstate New York, paralleling the can canal out to Buffalo, along the lake out to um, Chicago. Later in the 1950s, when the New York State Thruway is built, the road, it goes where? From just about the New York City-Westchester line, up to Albany, makes a left-hand turn, and again parallels the canal. So it becomes the pattern for transportation later. Okay, so that said, we get back to, therefore, whoops, whammo. The Erie Canal played a large role in the settlement of the Midwest because it provided a link between the Atlantic Ocean and the Great Lakes. That gave you that um, Great Lakes gave you the way into Michigan, as I said, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, let me just pick up this. Sorry, there we go. Okay. During the 1600s and 1700s, the fundamental goal of British mercantilism is what? We remember what mercantilism is. Mercantilism is all about um, mother country has colonies. The purpose of the colonies is to do what? To provide raw material to the mother country and mother country can then sell manufactured goods from that raw material back to the colonies. The key to that though is that the colonies were not allowed to trade with anybody but mother country. So to put it into the American colony context, you had the American colonies, 13 colonies, they were allowed to sell their tobacco, lumber, fish, rice, uh, wheat, everything else that they, that they got from America, even things like iron that they dug out of, there were iron mines in America. They were allowed to sell those to one country, England. England could buy the stuff from them, and because they couldn't sell to anybody else, England set the price. England didn't have to compete with anybody. They told the colonies what they were going to pay for it. England would buy those goods, bring them to England, manufacture them into whatever they were going to manufacture them into, and then sell them back to the colonies. The colonies weren't allowed to buy any of that stuff except from England. And therefore, England again could set the price they were selling it at. England could trade with anybody. 
so they could take in raw material from America and sell, make it into stuff to sell to France or Germany or any place else they wanted. And they could buy whatever they wanted from any place in the world. The colonies were restricted. So what did that do? It meant that the colonies were a closed economy to the mother country. And it gave the mother country, therefore, a big advantage. The more colonies you had, the more cheap raw material you had coming in, and the more of a market you had to sell your stuff. That's the principle of mercantilism. Okay, so during the 16 and 1700s, the fundamental goal of British mercantilism was, four, maintain a favorable balance of trade for Great Britain with its colonies. You look at the other choices there. Three, develop manufacturing within the colonies? No, they did not allow manufacturing. For instance, in America, it was illegal to have a, um, to have a forge where you make iron stuff, right? So you couldn't make wrought iron in America. You could get iron out of the ground that had to be sent back to England to be manufactured into stuff, but you couldn't make it here because then you're defeating the point of mercantilism. Choice two, encourage economic competition with the American colonies. This was the opposite of competition. Prohibit all exports of raw materials from the colonies. No, you prohibited exports to other countries. But England wanted that raw material all for itself, so they wanted all that stuff exported. So the only choice that makes sense there is number four. The Proclamation Line of 1763 was issued by Great Britain after the French and Indian War, primarily to do what? Okay, we remember the French and Indian War is between France and Britain. So, let's look at that proclamation for a minute. Okay, we remember that the French and Indian War, as I just said, was between France and its Indian allies and Britain. France, at this point, beginning of the French and Indian War, owns Canada and all the way down into this Ohio River Valley, the so-called province of Quebec. Britain and France are at war in Europe, the so-called Seven Years' War. And that war is all about all of these countries that are kind of pushing against each other for who's going to be the top dog in this new mercantilist world. The Indians that are in North America are looking at this and trying to figure out what to do. And the Indians looked at the French and said, there are just a few French in Canada. France never set up the kind of colonies that Britain did. If you remember, the French sent over a handful of guys whose job was to trade with the Indians. Well, when you trade with the Indians, you treat them to some degree like equals. They're like business partners. So the French never sent large numbers over, and they treated the Indians fairly okay. The British, on the other hand, did set up colonies. They had lots of people who came over and actually settled and built farms and then pushed Indians away from the coasts. So all of this dark red here, this is the British colonies. The British settle in here and push, 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 push the Indians away. Well, the Indians see this and they decide, <coughs> we're going to side with the French in this war between France and Britain. Say, how come? Because the Indians said, look, and the Indians, by the way, were not stupid. Never make the mistake that the Indians were naive or didn't understand politics. They were quite sophisticated. They said, look, the French are relatively weak. If we help them win against the British and we ever need to take down the French, they'll be easy. If, on the other hand, the British win this war, they are much more numerous, much more powerful, and they tend to push us away. So we're better off with the French winning. So the French and the Indians make an alliance, and they fight 
the British in the French and Indian War. Okay. 1763, France loses. Britain wins. And Britain gives the French a choice. They can either have Canada and this province of Quebec, or they can keep Martinique, this tiny little island in the Caribbean. So they say to the French, you lose the, the war, you've got to give up one or the other. We'll let you keep one, either Martinique or North America. And the French decide they'd rather keep Martinique. Why? Martinique's a tiny little island in the Caribbean, but it produced sugarcane. And even that tiny island produced so much money from sugarcane, it was far more lucrative to hang on to that than to hang on to all of their North American possessions. So they say, we'll keep Martinique, we'll give away um, North America. So the British get their hands on Canada and this province of Quebec, which is all of this in here, this lighter pink. Hooray. The first thing the British do then is say, the king issues a proclamation saying, now that we've won, Nobody is to cross this line, this proclamation line. Why not? Because this line is the top of the Appalachian Mountains. On the other side are the Indians. If you settlers move into the Ohio Valley and start to settle, you're going to tick off the Indians, they're going to attack you, and we're going to be right back with a war. Now, the British had a big problem. They had spent a huge amount of money on that French and Indian War. They were deeply in debt. The last thing they needed was another expensive war. So even though they won, even though they got all that land, they didn't want the colonists ticking off the Indians again, at least for a while. The colonists were furious. Many of the colonists had fought on the British side in that French and Indian War because, after all, they were British colonists. And the reason they had fought is because they wanted to get their hands on this Ohio Valley. That was where all the best farmland was. So these guys in Pennsylvania and upstate New York, they wanted desperately to start to settle in here, even though it was on the other side of the mountains and, as we just talked about, the Erie Canal is a hundred years away. They, you know, they they don't have that, or not quite a hundred years away, seventy years away. Um, but still, this is great farmland. They want to settle there, and so when Britain says, "Nope, you're not allowed to settle there," it infuriates the colonists. On top of which, the British turn around and then say, "Oh yeah, and by the way, we're going to tax the living daylights out of you." This war cost us so much, we have to figure out how to make our money back, and so we're going to tax the colonies to help pay for the debt of that war. The British attitude was, you're part of the British Empire too, you colonists. We all have to help pay for this war that we won. The colonists' attitude was, we went and fought this war. You know, we shed our blood. We were the troops. We were the soldiers out there. Now you're telling us, A, we can't use the land we won, and B, you're going to tax us for it on top of that. That was what started the march toward the American Revolution. All of that stuff that you remember, the Stamp Act, the Townsend Acts, the Intolerable Acts, were all started by this French and Indian War to help pay for it. And the proclamation line seemed like a slap in the face to the colonists. So, if we look at the question, the proclamation line of 1763 was issued by Great Britain after the French and Indian War primarily to limit conflict between Native American Indians and colonial settlers. They wanted to keep them away from each other until they had paid off the debt and you know, Britain was on a firm footing again, they could start thinking about expanding settlement. Okay, let's look at five. 
if I can do that. Nope. There we go. Okay. Thomas Paine, Common Sense. When you hear Thomas Paine, Common Sense, you're thinking American Revolution. So, when the revolution starts, the revolution starts, notice this, in 1775, April of 1775, that's Lexington and Concord. What are the colonists fighting for? They're fighting to be treated with all the rights of English citizens. In January of 1776, so March of 1775 to January 1776, so about three quarters of a year later, Thomas Paine writes his book, his pamphlet really, Common Sense. What is the point of common sense? He's saying to the colonists, we shouldn't be fighting for our rights as Englishmen because we're not Englishmen. We have become something new. We have become Americans. We have transformed into a new thing. And we should be fighting for England to recognize that we have become something new. So Thomas Paine's point is, the American experience, the colonist experience, of self-government, the Virginia House of Burgesses, the uh, Mayflower Compact, um, the New York Assembly, all of that stuff had been colonists governing themselves. Loyal Englishmen, but used to making their own decisions for themselves here on the North American continent. Payne says, that gave us a new way of looking at things. And without even realizing it, we have grown into a different kind of people. So while we once may have been English, we are no longer the same country. And it's time that Great Britain recognized that we have become something new. And therefore, says Thomas Paine, it's common sense that we should be demanding independence and recognition of that independence. January 1776. That changes the whole nature of this war that we call the revolution. Now, people start talking about, yeah, you know, he's right. Instead of fighting for our rights as English citizens, we should be fighting to be a new country. And by July of 1776, of course, that becomes the... Um, Declaration of Independence. Okay, so we take a look at this paragraph here. And this is one of Paine's arguments. His argument basically is that it's uh, Great Britain is a small island. North America is a gigantic continent. All through history, you've never had a little tiny island lording it over a giant continent. It's always the other way around. So we, it's absurd for this little island of England to be trying to rule mighty North America. So we look at the quote, small islands not capable of protecting themselves are the proper subjects for kingdoms to take under their care. So if you have a little island that can't look after itself, well, okay, that makes sense for Britain to colonize it. But there's something very absurd in supposing a continent to be perpetually governed by an island. In no instance hath nature made the satellite larger than the primary planet. And as England and America, with respect to each other, reverses the common order of nature, it is evident that they belong to different systems. England to Europe, America to itself. Okay. The argument presented in this passage was intended to do what? Number three, convince American colonists to declare their independence. I just notice here the Albany Plan of Union. Let's not forget that. That comes up sometimes on Regents exams. What was the Albany Plan of Union? That was Benjamin Franklin's plan, if you remember, during the French and Indian War, encouraging the 13 individual colonies to unite 
as a kind of province together. Franklin did not advocate during the French and Indian War that we be an independent country. He said that the 13 colonies should all kind of become one. We should have a sort of council among them and a certain amount of self-government here. The Albany Plan of Union never went anyplace. The British government didn't like it. They didn't like the idea of these colonies uniting. And the colonies didn't like it because it would have meant that each individual colony would have given up what little self-government it had. And so it never goes anyplace. But it's an early kind of uh, pre-American independence movement for unity on the North American continent. Okay, let's pick up them. All right. Um, James Madison, the Federalist. Okay. So, the Federalist, what is it? The Federalist is a series of letters to the editor of New York newspapers written by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay. In 1787, um, well, let's take a step back. We, when the, the, um, well, let me actually do this. Okay. So this is worth noting here. Don't need this. I can get this to work. Okay. 1776, we get independence. Right? We are now a new country. We need a new government. So what's the plan for our government? The Articles of Confederation. And under the Articles of Confederation, which is the first document that forms a government for the country, what is the government? The government is Congress. What else? That's it. The Articles have no executive branch, no president, no courts. And in order for Congress to do anything, basically, it has to be unanimous. In other words, the Articles of Confederation create a Congress that can make rules for the new country, but there is nobody who can enforce those rules or carry them out, and no court to uh, interpret those rules in a given situation. Furthermore, in order to do anything in Congress, you needed to get all of the colonies to go along with it. Basically, you had to be unanimous or near unanimous. As you know, if you get three or four people together about anything, it's almost impossible to get unanimity. The Articles also made the country a confederation of states. So it treated the new country as though it were 13 little independent countries, each of whom as an equal had become part of this new country. So each state was equal with every other state. That's why you needed unanimity, because if one state dissented, uh, it w that state was opting out of this. The Articles of Confederation are the basis for our government until you have that event, Shays Rebellion. Daniel Shays, who was a farmer in Massachusetts, and his friends, um, basically in this kind of terrorist attack, take over courts in Massachusetts because they're not happy with the taxation policy up there. 
What does the national government do? Nothing. It doesn't have any power. It doesn't have any authority. Eventually, between the Massachusetts militia and what you had of a kind of national um, government, they did put down Shays' Rebellion, but barely so, and it scared the hell out of people. So in 1787, we say, we've got to scrap all that and start over. We're going to write a new document called a Constitution. And the Constitution is going to be different. And how is it going to be different? Well, the Constitution, first of all, is going to be we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the, the common defense, promote the general welfare, to ordain and, and establish the blessing of liberty to ourselves and our uh, posterity, to ordain and establish this Constitution. That's the preamble. And that preamble is damned important because it says this new country is not a federation of 13 independent states. It's a federation, if you like. It's a republic of all of we, the people. The whole people is one making this Constitution. Oh yeah, we, are, we have 13 states. But it's not the states agreeing to this, it's all the people of America. And so you have that idea of popular sovereignty. Popular sovereignty is the idea that the ultimate owners of the government are the people as a whole. Popular, not as in, you know, everybody likes them, but the people's sovereignty, the people's ownership of the government. Second idea that's in that Constitution is federalism. Now the word federalism means a lot of different things in American history. In this case it means that there is a split between federal power and state power. The federal government has the authority to do some things. The states have the authority to do other things. The, um, we see this even right now in our own circumstance. No, nope. I want this up here. Um, the federal government has the authority to do some things, including guarantee that states function according to the Constitution. The states have the authority to do other things that the federal government cannot interfere with. So if a governor declares a quarantine within his state, the federal government can't override him. The point of federalism is it is a check. Federal power is checking state power and state power is checking federal power so that neither one becomes too powerful. Also built into this new constitution is um, separation of powers. They build into it three branches. Now, as I've told you guys, all government, all government, all government, all government has three functions. Legislative. executive, and judicial. All government makes rules, legislative, administers or carries out the rules, executive, and then judges based on the rules. So whether it's the government of a Cub Scout pack or of a school or of a state or of a football team, you have that. Um, the, in some cases, they're all together. So in school, the principal makes the rules. He gets advice from the faculty, but he makes the rules. The principal carries out those rules, administers them. 
He does it sometimes through the faculty, but ultimately he's the authority. And finally, if there's a question as to what a rule means or how it applies or whether you broke it, he decides that too. So he's the chief judge. So in that case, the legislative, the executive, and the judicial functions are all in one person. In the United States, we separate those powers out. The legislative power is in the hands of Congress. The executive power is in the hands of the president, and the judicial power is in the hands of the courts, particularly the Supreme Court. Congress makes the rules. It's the job of the president to carry them out, and it's the job of the Supreme Court to interpret what do those rules mean in a particular circumstance. The point of the separation of powers is that each is pushing against each other. Congress pushes against the president, the Supreme Court pushes against the president and Congress. So these are the checks and balances. Like what? Congress makes law, but the president can veto it, but Congress can override that veto. The Supreme Court can declare something Congress does unconstitutional. They can declare something the president does unconstitutional. The president appoints the members of the Supreme Court, but he has to have the Senate um, confirm those appointments. So each of them has a way that they push on the power of the others. And because of that, each of them keeps the other two in their proper place. Yeah? So uh, separation of powers. We also have a, the concept in our Constitution, know it, limited government. Now, what does that really mean for us? The federal government doesn't have power, and then we limit it. The federal government has no power. And then in the Constitution, we give it the power to do this, and we give it the power to do that. So think of it this way. It's not like we draw a boundary around the power of government. It's that the government is a blank piece of paper, and it only has the powers that we have written on that piece of paper that we call the Constitution. All of that goes into um, the, the writing of this Constitution. We also have to point out uh, something else, this Congress business here. So how, does the, how do they set up Congress? Well, the first plan they had was the Virginia plan, which said, okay, Congress should have a certain number of representatives for each state based on population. So a big state gets more say than a little state because there's more people there. Virginia was very much in favor of that because Virginia at the time was the most populous state. Ha ha ha. The second plan was the New Jersey plan. The New Jersey plan said each state should be equal. All the states are members of this country, so it doesn't matter if you're big and sm or small. Each state should have an equal say. New Jersey happened to be one of the least populated states in the country, and so it wanted an equal say with Virginia. Ha, ha, ha. They wind up with the Connecticut plan, also called the Great Compromise. And what is the point of the Great Compromise? If I can get a little room here. The Great Compromise said, why not do both? So Congress is going to have two houses. The House of Representatives which will be based on population, and the Senate. Each state, no matter how big or small, gets two senators. This way, big states like Virginia get more say in the House of Representatives, 
but little states like New Jersey get to balance that. And to get a law passed, you have to get both houses to agree to. You need a majority in each house. House of Representatives, the members are elected for two years at a time, and the whole house goes up at once. That is, everybody in the House gets elected at the same time. So every two years, the whole House of Representatives changes. And you only have to be 25 to be in the House of Representatives. So what's the idea? This is the fresh House. Every two years, you can change all the members, and so it's very responsive to changes in mood by the people. The Senate, each senator gets a six-year term, and only a third, oops, a third up at a time. So of the senators, every two years, only one third of them are up because they have six-year terms. That way, the Senate changes slowly. It has a longer-term outlook. So that's a balance there, too. The House of Representatives responds to the mood of the moment, fresh blood, fresh ideas. The Senate slows them down and says, well, let's wait a minute and take a longer look at this. The Senate, though, can get kind of stagnant, yeah, stale. The House of Representatives could be sort of too influenced by the mood of the moment. So, in theory, the worst parts of each are balanced out by the other house. They had one other problem they had to deal with. House of Representatives is based on population. Who am be a population? Who counts as a person? So they came up with an idea. Every 10 years, you're going to have a census. And this is what we're doing actually right now is, as I'm recording this. This year, 2020, is a census year. So um, they count everybody in the country and figure out, therefore, how many seats in the House each state gets. Back then, 1787, they decide to count everybody in a state who is white. Well, what about the slaves? The New England states, like Massachusetts, don't want slaves counted at all. Slaves can't vote, they don't pay taxes, and Southerners tell us they're just property. So why should they count? And the reason New England didn't want those counted is because if you did, if you counted those slaves, it would double the number of representatives Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina got. In a lot of those states, half the population were slaves. Massachusetts, by 1787, didn't have slavery anymore. States like New York continued to have slaves, but there were just a few of them here, at least a few compared to Virginia. So they said, why should Virginia and North Carolina and South Carolina and Georgia get an advantage because they have so many slaves? Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina wanted to count slaves because it would give them a big advantage and because they were afraid without that advantage, places like Massachusetts might try to do away with slavery permanently. So they came up with what was called the three fifths compromise. You'd count all the white people in your state. Separately, you'd count all the black people, who were almost all of them slaves. You'd multiply the number of slaves times three fifths, that is to say 60 percent, and that number you would add to the population of whites to, to come up with a quote population for figuring out how many representatives in Congress you got. So understand, there are some people who will tell you, ah, the three-fifths compromise means that a slave counted as three-fifths of a person. 
That is not true. The slave counted as not a person at all. Slaves were never people. They weren't half a person. They were just nothing. Sadly, it's a great stain on American history. For purposes of the math, though, you multiply the whole number of slaves time th times three-fifths. That's not the same thing as saying that a slave is three-fifths of a human being. That's not at all what it means. The three-fifths compromise, New Englanders said, well, okay, that cuts down their advantage enough that we'll live with it. And the southern states said, well, that gives us enough of an advantage that we're not afraid that we're going to lose our slaves. Okay, once the Great Compromise is done and the Constitution is written, how do you sell the Constitution? Well, first, the Federalist Papers. John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison write these, as I said, letters to the editor to these New York newspapers explaining line by line by line why the, what the Constitution means, this new Constitution that we're proposing, what it means, and why you should vote for it. Because after they wrote it, it had to go out to each of the 13 states and be approved. And a lot of people said, I don't know about this. I don't think this is a good idea. We just fought a revolution. We get to, against the government with too much power. This constitution seems, is very complicated and it gives government too much power. So Hamilton, Madison, and Jay wrote these, these letters explaining line by line the constitution, what it, what it means, why they wrote it the way they did, why it's a good idea, and why you should vote for it. Those letters have been collected into now a book called The Federalist Papers. You can buy a paperback copy of it. And it's still used even today when the Supreme Court or congressmen want to see what did they mean when they wrote the Constitution, what did they mean by this line? You know, um, when we just had the uh, relatively recently the impeachment of President Trump. And congressmen all ran to get their copies of the Federalist Papers and say, when it says you can impeach the president for high crimes and misdemeanors, what did Alexander Hamilton mean by that? And they go, went to look it up. It's still used today to interpret the Constitution. Okay. Well, there was a group called the Anti-Federalists who said, we don't like this Constitution because there's nothing in it about individual rights. There's nothing in this Constitution about freedom of speech, freedom of the press, any of that. So at first, Hamilton said, well, you don't have to worry about that. Of course, nobody's going to violate that. The Anti-Federalists said, we don't trust it. So the second thing they did to sell the Constitution was they came up with the bill of rights. So Hamilton said, if you pass the Constitution, if you approve it, I promise you the very first thing the new Congress will do is approve 10 amendments to the Constitution. Those amendments are what we call the Bill of Rights. <clears throat> For a, an amendment to become part of the Constitution, it needs to pass both houses of Congress by a two-thirds vote each, and then three-quarters of the state legislatures. So it's very hard to amend the Constitution, but possible. So Hamilton said, I'll tell you what, we'll pass it through Congress, and then we'll send it out to the states. So the Constitution gets passed. First thing they do is the Bill of Rights. And in short order, it does that, and it gets added to the U.S. Constitution. Okay, so we go back to our test then. So we have this quote from the Federalist. No political truth is of greater, intrins uh, greater intrinsic value or is stamped with the authority of more enlightened patrons of liberty 
than that on which the objection is founded. The accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary in the same hands, whether of one, a few, or many, whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elective, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. What's the constitutional principle he's talking about? Answer, separation of powers. Let's look at the next one. We have these two quotes, one from the Articles of Confederation and one from the Constitution. Articles Confederation, each state retains its sovereignty, freedom, and independence, and every power, jurisdiction, and right which is not by this confederation expressly delegated to the United States in Congress assembled. In other words, every state retains all the power that is not actually given in the Articles Confederation to the federal government. Okay, now we look at the Tenth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. In other words, if it's not given to the federal government, it's automatically kept by the states, that power, or by the people themselves. Look at the question. The purpose of each of these provisions is to determine the division of power between state and central governments. That's the idea of that federalism. States have one set of power, federal government has a different set of power, and they can use that to keep each other from getting too powerful. We look at question nine. President Jackson vetoes bill rechartering Bank of the United States. Okay, so the president vetoed the Bank of the United States. Tawney Court overturns the Missouri Compromise. Chief Justice Tawney, Supreme Court, overturned the Missouri Compromise, which was a congressional law. Tawney found the Missouri Compromise unconstitutional in that case called Dred Scott. The Senate approves a NATO treaty. NATO treaty, okay, a treaty is negotiated by the President but has to be ratified by the Senate. So we have the President vetoing something Congress did, that is chartering the bank, the Supreme Court declaring something Congress did unconstitutional, and the Senate deciding to approve something the president did. What concept is illustrated by these? Checks and balances. What was a major demand of the Anti-Federalists during the debate over ratification of the Constitution? Inclusion of a Bill of Rights. Okay, we'll leave it there and we'll pick up with the next set of questions in the next video.